time, I'll, I'll start our, our panel discussion. It is um, my great honor to introduce this, this panel um, discussion on extreme oil, the politics of extraction. Um, in in uh, the next uh, uh, hour and a bit, we're going to learn about uh, this, this problem, and I'm going to read this off the abstract, so I think it's, it's quite important. Um, this problem of unburnable but extractable oil reserves and the economic, social, and political inertia that is created by big oil and captured state institutions um, in the face of our treaty and environmental obligations, so how to move forward. This panel is staged as a conversation um, that comes out of the research of uh, social sciences and humanities uh, research council funded project called the Corporate Mapping Project. And this, uh, this Corporate Mapping Project is done in affiliation with the University of Victoria, um, the uh, Center for Canadian Policy Alternatives in BC, and the Parkland Institute. Um, and, and we are going to be learning about the research that's come out of a particular arm of that project, the, the Big 8 project. So we're going to look at the five bitumen extractors and three pipeline operators that control most of the oil sands industry and also the, the environmental uh, effects as well as the effects on indigenous rights. Uh, so our panel, I'll just do a very brief introduction. You have their bios in, in your sheet. Uh, we have Ian Hussey, who is uh, um, a research manager at the Parkland Institute, Emma Jack Jackson, who is uh, uh, an MA candidate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta, as well as a research assistant with the Corporate Mapping Project, and Eric uh, Pinot, who is a professor at the Université du Québec à Montréal, um, and uh, where he teaches political economy in the Department of Sociology and Ecological Economics. So um, I'm going to say that we will be leaving our questions till the end. The panel is going to go straight through. Uh, so there, there's lots of time for questions at the end, but if you can hold off and uh, keep your comments right till the end of our presentation, uh, that, that would be great. And I'm going to pass it over right now to our panel. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'll be setting the scene for the research that's to come. Uh, this is a project that we're working, the three of us together, trying to understand um, um, the restructuring of the, of the sector in Alberta uh, during the current downturn and trying to understand overall in a, in a kind of 10, 15 year cycle what is happening with the, um, with the uh, oil sands sector, working on um, what we call the big eight. So what are the big eight? Well, the five biggest bitumen extractors um, it, here in Canada, um, and then the three biggest bitumen transporters, so the pipeline companies. And we're trying to understand how these companies work, how they think, um, mostly. And that's mostly, I, I, I guess that, that's mostly my job, how they think, and then um, um, Ian is mostly how they work, and Emma is the conflicts that are growing around what they're doing. Um, so I spend a lot of time, um, and I'm, I'm not from Alberta, I'm, I'm from back east, trying to understand, trying to put my, myself in the head of the CEOs of these companies. So I'm really, really happy um, to be in a Suncor sponsored room for this presentation. <laughs> I mean, this is great, you know. So, so I will acknowledge that I am on territory that belongs, unfortunately, to the Suncor. It's been dispossessed, and it belongs to this big corporation. And I think it's important to start with that fact, because this is the type of power we're speaking about. Um, and, and speaking of Steve Williams, um, I'm going to start a bit with Steve Williams, and, and ha yeah, he's the CEO of Suncor. Sorry, I thought since I'm in Alberta, everybody knows Steve Williams, and you know, knows Steve, and meets him, you know, drinks a coffee with him. You know, for me, he's this far away figure that I'm studying. I don't even know what he looks like. Um, um, and, and maybe just to understand a bit how these, so one thing that really surprised me coming from the East is this quote from Steve Williams two weeks ago, speaking with investment bankers um, on, on Suncor's strategy. And, and um, answering a question on pipelines um, um, from um, an investment banker from, um, this one, this uh, person was from Barclays, I think. Um, he answers, um, very frankly, pipes and price differentials. Now, if you're from the East, you know what price differentials is all about. Um, pipes and price differentials are not something I lose sleep over. So this is what Steve Williams says to investors. It's not something that I've heard 
I don't think it's something you hear here either, that he doesn't really care about new pipelines and that price differentials are really not an issue for Suncor. So this is the type of stuff that we're trying to understand at the corporate mapping project because there are discourses that are different um, in function of the audiences that you're addressing. And we're trying to understand um, um, the, the way uh, they think amongst themselves. And the CEO I'm going to work with today is not um, Steve Williams um, of Suncor, unfortunately. I'm going to work with um, another CEO called Rick Kruger. Um, I don't know if you know Rick Kruger. He's the CEO of Imperial Oil. Imperial Oil being um, the, the Exxon branch of, of, of Exxon in Canada. Um, brother. Pardon me? His friend is brother. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> ah, that's somebody that I don't know, not being from Alberta. You... Uh, it's uh, Friday the 13th, Joe. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. I have no... <laughs> that was a joke that I didn't get. I really look stupid at this point. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, Rick Kruger has four big ideas on, on oil and on oil sands development. And these four big ideas are a bit the starting point of the research we're doing. Um, and uh, I want to share these four big ideas that, that he has. Um, the first uh, big idea is called Horizon 240. Um, actually, Horizon 240, it's a year, is, is two big ideas. The first one is that in 240, there will have been a 25% energy demand growth the world over. And this, this idea doesn't come from um, um, Rick Kruger, it actually comes from Exxon, but this is a consensus that is shared by Exxon, by BP, and by the International Energy Agency. What Exxon adds to this consensus of energy demand growth until 240 is the idea that half of this growth, the increment added to the current energy consumption, will be met by oil, either in a gas, or uh, either oil or gas, or by hydrocarbons. So this is something that BP and that um, um, uh, Shell are not certain about. They, they, they tend to buy in the idea of peak demand. But this is something that Exxon really firmly believes in. And it's something that structures the way they invest and the way they, they think about their growth. It's also a, a belief that is shared by Suncor, um, Cenevis, Cen CNRL, and Husky. I verified that. They all have the, they're all working with the same con consensus. I think you, you were discussing consensus is a couple of minute, uh, scientific consensus is in the fact that you can't really discuss and debate them because when a consensus exists, it's a consensus. Well, this is an industry consensus, that half of this incremental growth. So it means that oil will not only go down in the basket of energy providers or carriers that we're using, but oil will actually go up a bit. That's first big idea. Second big idea, Horizon 240, 80% of today's exploited sources of oil and gas will be depleted by 2040, and thus they must be replaced before 2040 at about a 5% replacement rate, which means that we have to open up new sources of hydrocarbons, either oil or gas. Um, and of course, this is all going to be unconventional, so-called unconventional sources. I'll get back to that. So two very big ideas, and you can see third, third big idea. North America is going to be the energy powerhouse that will fuel the growth in the 21st century. This is a very strong belief that is held by people in Exxon and by people of Imperial. Um, just to give you one, I, I won't give you a lot of numbers. There's no PowerPoint presentation that I'm an economist, so I can like clobber you with numbers, but I decided this was not a good idea. But maybe one number, okay, if you look at um, the proportion of private sector um, investment in Canada from about, I'd say, 205 to up to 214, okay? 20% of private sector investment was in the oil sector. So that means that one out of every five dollars being invested in our economy was going into that one sector. Now, if you look at US private sector investment, this might surprise you, but from 212 to 215, the last time I looked, 20% of private sector investment in the US was going in the oil sector. So the US is not only a high tech, um, 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 Google economy, it is also an economy that is growing its primary sector. It is caught in a commodity cycle just as, uh, just as we were. Um, I want to quote uh, Mr. Kruger, not, not the Peter, but uh, Rick. Um, I can play with this joke now that I know it. Uh, I, I watched Friday the 13th when I was like maybe 12 or 13 years old, so it gives you an idea how old I am. So, All right, Mr. Kruger. Quoting on what this means for him, okay, and the words here are very important. 
It tells you a lot on how he thinks. The oil sands represent 97% of Canada's liquids. I like that sentence because <laughs> it says two things. A, 97%, okay, but liquids. <laughs> so the oil sands is, I, I, you know, I, I, I've used pitch on my roof like to fix things. I mean, I don't define it that much as a liquid. It's kind of, you know, sticky and lumpy, but no, it's a liquid. So, so, uh, and obviously he, he, he draws out the number that we all hear all the time, one, 170 billion barrels of reserves. And then he says, the key to their access depends on our economic environmental competitiveness. Now, I will repeat this, it's really important. On our economic environmental, the words are together in a sentence, they're stuck one beside the other. In economic environmental, it's the same thing, competitiveness. So that's the way um, Mr. Kruger understands this third big idea that North America is going to be the powerhouse of, of, of energy growth in the 21st century. We have become effectively the swing producer that can break OPEC's prices, North America. Canada broke the prices for a long time and now it's shale oil that's doing the same job. So we decide basically um, um, what, what the, that price will be. Fourth big idea, um, th this time I'll, I'll come back to Suncor and then that'll be all for Suncor and I'll get into other stuff. Um, what is the near to medium term perspective of the hydrocarbon industry for Canada and for the oil sector in particular? I'm not going to talk about the gas sector, but through, how do they see the you know, medium term conjuncture for oil in Canada? So this is um, Steve Williams, um, Suncor's CEO, um, and, and his rhetoric is really Perfect. I mean, it's so, so he calls this, this is also in an investor conference call, so he's talking to bankers. Um, he's answering a question from somebody from Goldman Sachs in this. This is also drawn from the um, October uh, conference call. So it's the Q3 217 conference call. Suncor philosophy, he says. We have a, we have a philosophy at Suncor. He says it, this philosophy was written out in, two of, in, in 215. So the days of growth for growth's sakes are over. Our focus is on free cash generation and returning more cash to shareholders. That's it. So forget job growth, forget investment, forget, you know, forget uh, expansion. We are in a phase of consolidation and this phase of consolidation is geared toward one primary objective, getting the money out of Alberta and shipping it to Bay Street. Sending it to Bay Street. That's where it's going. Can you repeat that really quick and repeat that quote? We have a philosophy. Yeah, our philosophy, the days of growth for growth's sakes are over. Our focus is on, the, on free cash generation and returning more cash to shareholders. Um, if you look at Imperial, the way Imperial sees this, it's even, it's even more straightforward, but it's a graph and I didn't want to bombard you with graphs, but the graph is really interesting. It's a graph they show, on, it's part of their road show to investors. And they have this graph where they say, okay, this is how we, we allocate our free, um, our free cash. So, you know, the cash that is generated over and above our operations, our current operations. So, it's, it's a bar graph. So, the bottom of the bar graph, it's written, um, dividends and share buybacks. That's the, so the minute we have a dollar over our operations, dividends and share buybacks. Then if we can fill that, that part of the, of the bar graph up, okay, then we can move up a step. The second step is called sustaining investment. In, 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 I was, I was going to say in French, sorry, in English, in plain English, sustaining investment means putting money back into your machine so they can keep on running at the same rate they were running before. I mean, you're not expanding, you're just keeping the machine going. So they're paying dividends before sustained investment. And then, if they can fill up all their sustained investment, then the rest goes in what they call growth. Growth targeted investment. So this is the new era in which we're in, and that's the era me and Ian and Emma are trying to understand. And, and then the idea I want to get to, I guess the first analytical concept I want to introduce is the anal analytical concept of extractivism. So what would be extractivism? Um, um, for us, extractivism is, is, is a political economy. And it's a political economy where the ext developing um, extractive, the extractive sector, an extractive sector linked to global markets and protecting extractive capital, as well as fostering a colonial-based growth coalition 
around the extractive sector. And this growth coalition um, um, is based on certain hierarchies of race, of class, and of gender, and this is really important. So that's the, 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 the kind of mix, the social mix that, that extractivism, extractivism, sorry, is based, I'm used to saying this in French, is based on. And we have, you know, extractive tendencies in Quebec also. We've got a hydrocarbon sector that is appearing. We have our, a lot of what the research, the theoretical research I do is based on what's happening in my province. So I'm not like coming from Quebec saying, hey, you guys are, you know, doing bad things. We're doing the exact same things in Quebec. So, so I could be speaking on and, and talking about June X Petrolia and, and our own home-based home companies. So, um, uh, an extract, extractivism means an extractive-based development regime. And these regimes are tied to the commodity cycles. When you have a booming commodity cycle, your regime has certain specific characteristics. When you have a consolidating um, um, commodity cycle, your regime has other characteristics. And I think we have to be able to distinguish between regimes, so booming extractivism, which is what we had up until 2014, and consolidating extractivism, which is what we have now. And they have very different, very different outcomes and very different um, um, dynamics. But one thing that we know about the one that we're in today, the consolidating one, is that this type of extractivism and this type of extractive capital development, um, it's based on cost control. And I think people that are around Fort Mac are living that. For, for cost control means suppliers being squeezed, workers being squeezed, more accidents, uh, more overtime, um, um, fixing less, running more, downtime all the time also. Okay, so cost control, but also and most importantly, channeling all productivity gains out of the sector, which is not what you do in a booming situation. When you're in a booming situation, you channel your productivity gains into the sector to expand. Now it's being channeled out and it's being it's not being reinvested, it's being channeled out and tr transferred to the financial sector. So basically, all the activity that, is, that, that, is, that exists right now um, is, is based on getting the money out of Alberta and down to Toronto, where then it's recycled into different um, um, shareholders. And, and I could show you some graphs from the companies themselves, and we are working on the amount of money that's coming out. So we're, we're going to aggregate the amount of dividends and share buybacks. But when you look at the numbers, it's actually, it's, the regime change is massive. You really see a stepping up, an explosion of dividends and of share buybacks since 2015. Whereas beforehand, the level is, is, is rather low. So that's, that's the first idea I wanted to introduce, and, and if I have time, a second idea, which is um, we work with this concept of extreme oil, and I just wanted to define it, and I think it, it, it can maybe frame a bit what we're, um, what the type of work we're doing. But that was the first idea, try to understand what's happening um, um, in this cycle. So let's, let's take a step back from what I've just presented and, and look at the, at, at, at the more general idea of extreme oil and why we use that, that concept. Um, where does this concept come from? Well, first of all, extreme oil replaces peak oil. Um, we've gone from running out of oil, Mad Max type scenarios, to more oil than we can burn scenario, which is really weird. I mean, peak oil was all about, you know, we're going to run out of oil, so anyway, we won't have climate change. So now we have so much oil that we can probably boil the planet if we keep on going. And the problem with unburnable carbon is that when you burn it, you don't see it. See, when, when you run out of oil, you see, you know, the, you know the, there's nothing coming out of the well anymore. So peak oil is kind of like an in-your-face thing. There's just no more oil, right? Whereas filling up the sky with CO2 is very dif difficult to visualize. And a lot of the debates that you were having about an hour ago are around how do you visualize in a credible way something that can only be produced by science. Whereas, you know, running out of oil in, in the ground is kind of obvious, you know, you just there's nothing coming out of the tube anymore. Whereas filling up the sky with CO2 is totally, so, 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 so that's one characteristic of, this, of, of extreme oil. The second introductory uh, idea is that um, it's, it's, a, it's a slogan before it became a concept. And this slogan came out of the anti-fracking movement in the US. And I talked with people um, um, from that movement, from Appalachia, and who were at the origin of the term, and they were saying, listen, we started mobilizing against unconventional gas. And people were like, oh, unconventional, that's cool. 
It's like, you know, why would I be against unconventional? I'm like a progressive, you know, environmentalist. And, you know, does that mean oil with Birkenstocks, right? You know, is that like unconventional oil? Is it organic? You know, does it, is it vegan oil? So they said, we have to reframe. And see, these are activists and think, how can we reframe to move the discourse? And that's why they adopted the term extreme. They say, by doing that, we move the discourse. Just like, you know, we can't say tar sands anymore. We all say oil sands now because we don't want to be decredibilized. We don't want to be attacked on that. We want to be attacked on the substance of our argument, not on the form. So we don't say tar sands. We all say oil sands. But we know it is tar sands we're talking about. You know, we are talking about tar. It's not oil. It's not a liquid. It's gunk. So, well, I don't. I can't. If I say that, then, you know, I'll just bit, shoot, shoot off the stage. All right. So extreme came out of a movement, but the idea is, can we find some content in extreme? And the other thing, and then the third, the third idea is that um, we moved from the substance to the era. So extreme oil used to be about substances. So it was fracked oil, it was tar sand oil based oil, bitumen. It was um, oil from, and then we started to say, no, wait a minute, it's, if we believe what um, um, the industry is telling us that the 21st century will, will be the century of unconventional oil, then extreme oil is not an, a substance, it's an era. I mean, it's the 21st century, right? That is, I mean, if we continue on our oil-based development, then the 21st century is going to be the age of extreme oil. So that's how we think about it. So this age of extreme oil has four characteristics, and I think it's very important to well, we tend in our research to use these characteristics as, as way to analyze the problem. Um, so why do we say extreme? Well, I, I already said it. Um, extreme because we have more oil than we can burn. Um, now that's kind of banal, but what does that mean? How does that translate for an economist? Well, that translates in, 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 in that the value of a reserve is not only its price um, as we extract it. It acquires a new price, which is not a plus but a minus, it's a cost. Every reserve now has a value, an extractable value, and it has a social cost of carbon value. That's new. 10 years ago, no, a reserve was just worth what it's worth. Now, from an e economical point of view, we can reprice all our reserves according to the cost that they will incur if they're burnt. That is not something we could do 10 years ago. So, that's, so the first idea that we have more oil than we can burn translates into very concretely this idea that they are not only assets, they also have a cost, and a very important cost. And then we can start to, to, to argue around what that cost is. Second, all the new sources, second property of, of, of this age, all the new sources used during the 21st century will be more emissions intensive than the ones that we used in the 20th century, that's one aspect of it, but much more important is that the 21st century forms of oil are all high-tech, capital-intensive forms of oil. This is not a low-tech, mechanical um, um, sector. The 21st century sector of oil is, is a very high-tech, which means a very um, innovative, research and development intensive sector. We've got to pour a lot of public money to get this oil out. It's going to monopolize our engineers, our scientists, our geologists, are going to have to work like crazy to figure out where it is, how it is, because we don't even know what form it takes. We've discovered the shale form, we've discovered the sand form, there's maybe other forms that are out there. Um, so, so it is, and it is a very high-tech se uh, sector. You know, we all talk about 3D, uh, 3D uh, reality, this, uh, this uh, idea of virtual reality. The biggest game room for virtual reality is in Texas. And it's this game room for geologists, and they use this to, they, they have this huge arena, and they put on their goggles, and they literally walk inside the reserve. And the reserve is projected by a computer, and then they can find exactly where they, could, they, should, they can put in the straw. This is the biggest virtual reality playground that our society has generated is for geologists. So, so that the third, uh, this idea of unconventional means this high-tech, research-intensive. That's a third and fourth, and then I'm done. My, yeah, I have to speed up a bit, right? Probably just wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're used to working together. So, 
The third, and then fourth, and then, and then I, I shut up at that point. <laughs> okay, if we say that 80% of the, of the sources of oil we will burn in the 21st century are going to be new, further, deeper, that means far away, right? But far away is not only far away, like the North Pole, like deep sea, um, like in Yukon, or I don't know, or, but it can also be deeper and further in our communities, in our settler or indigenous communities. That's where they're gonna be found. Or, or at least that's where we're gonna to have to have the pipes to be able to push them through. So this means that the third property of extreme oil is a lot of social and environmental conflicts. And new forms of dispossessions we haven't even dreamed of yet. Or dreamed of, or, or, or had um, bad dreams about? Nightmares? Nightmared yet, nightmared yet. You know, when the shale oil revolution, shale gas revolution exploded in Quebec, people all of a sudden understood that they could be dispossessed of their water wells because somebody found some gas under their, under their farmland. You didn't think of that 20 years ago, that, that underground that could be expropriated. You could be expropriated from, from the water under your, so, so that means that the booms and the busts and the economic disruptions will provoke new social and, and territorial conflicts. Um, and that's a lot what we'll be talking about. New forms of dispossessions that will be created by these technological innovations that we don't even know of yet. Finally, fourth, and then I end. It's my conclusion. The fourth characteristic is, 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 is what we could say the business as usual syndrome. We know we have enough oil to burn ourselves through the 21st century. Why change? You know, we've got it, it's there. It's, you know, Mad Max, we can push that off two centuries at least. So, so it creates this dialectic between we need oil, we have oil. We need oil, we have oil. What does we need oil mean? It means that we need this huge amounts of abstract, transportable, appropriable energy. We don't have to imagine an energy descent, a degrowth of our energy demand because of global warming. No, we need this stuff, we, we're hooked on it. And then we have oil. So, so why, you know, and, and this we have oil feeds into, into inertia that is built into our infrastructure. The roads, the bridges, the parking lots, the malls, the suburbs. The, so, so that dialectic um, reinforces what we could call the carbon lock-in. And, and, and then I'm going to conclude with this. Um, um, and, it, and it comforts us that the state that we are in is normal. This high energy high flexible material world that we're in is like the normal state of the world. Um, and, and it's just a question of, of having a, sh a fair share of this high energy world that we're in, high in, you know, intense world that we're in. Um, and that's what you know, Linda was talking about yesterday. You know, it's just a question of do we have the 50s and 60s model or do we have the 80s and 90s model? Well, the 50s and 60s model was subsidized by you know, the work of these bacteria back 200 million years ago, which created these these hydrocarbons in the first place. And this was a one-shot deal. We got that energy, we burnt it, we filled the sky with CO2, we're not gonna get it again. So, so we, it, there, there's a, a very disquieting material question around, around the, the, the era of extreme oil. So I'm gonna finish with, with uh, one idea and then le leave it to the others. Um, the, the, this era of extreme oil is gonna be one of conflict over transition. And I think I've laid out part of the forces that are working against transition. And now we're going to start to look at concretely on the, on the ground how these forces are matching up one against the other. So I'll leave it to you. Is that okay? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Huzzy. I'm a political economist with the Parkland Institute. I uh, work on the corporate mapping project full time. Um, one of the, the projects I'm involved in is, is this project, the Big 8 project. Um, to take a step back from what Eric was saying uh, and, and talk in a more practical sense of how we're rolling out this research, uh, we've been doing this work. Uh, we, we wrote the proposal for this project uh, maybe 15 months ago. And so we're at a point now where um, Eric is the lead author on a report we're drafting uh, at present on uh, the restructuring of the oil industry. Uh, that's going to be something that, that Parkland, uh, in partnership with our, our, our partners at, at uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives and the University of Victoria, through the Corporate Mapping Project, will be publishing in, probably in the spring of uh, 2018. 
Uh, I'm actually going to be speaking about uh, a second report that uh, is, is part of the Big 8 project, but is looking specifically at the, the five uh, oil producers um, that make up the Big 5, which is uh, Suncor, Canadian Natural Resources, Cenevis, uh, Imperial Oil, and Husky Energy. And uh, the report that, uh, this other report that I've written um, that will be released in January, uh, I wrote with um, someone who just finished their PhD at U of A named uh, David Jansen, uh, who um, is teaching at another university, so he's not able to be here. Um, so the report that David and I wrote um, <clears throat> is called uh, What the Paris Agreement Means for Alberta's Oil Sands Majors. And, and so we're looking uh, at two sets of data in that report. I'm only going to talk about one of them. Um, the first set of data is, is on what Eric referred to at one point um, called the social cost of carbon. And so um, in, uh, in Canada and elsewhere, uh, economists like ourselves are, are talking about um, pricing carbon pollution and specifically uh, evaluating uh, oil reserves based on um, the, uh, a monetary measure of, of what um, the damages that happen from, from combusting oil or the monetary benefits, if you put it in monetary terms, of uh, not burning a certain <laughs> amount of oil. And so the first half of the, the Big Five in Paris report, uh, is what we call it for shorthand, um, is on um, looking at at the uh, social cost of carbon of the, the oil reserves of these five corporations. Uh, and the long and the short of it is um, their environmental liabilities are actually larger than the annual GDP of Alberta, which is $309 billion. Um, so if we were to actually um, internalize, this is, this is an economic term, uh, so if you, if you don't consider uh, environmental prices, you're externalizing that price. It's not considered in, in the economic evaluation of the, the, the value of a resource. Well, if you internalize it, you're actually pricing the carbon. And if, if you do that, it turns out that... Um, um, yeah, anyway, their, their assets are effectively worthless if you were to evaluate them based also on uh, the damage they would do, not only environmentally, but uh, social issues that arise from uh, carbon pollution. Anyway, the other half of the report is uh, drawing on uh, a Moody's Investor Services report that was released in April. Uh, if you don't know Moody's Investor Services, they're a credit rating agency, so they would, they would evaluate uh, the credit... Uh, um, uh, ability to pay back debts of, of governments or corporations and so they wrote a report and we use the same um, model of analysis that they use to specifically look at these five corporations and so what they did is Moody said okay we want to look at the substantial risks uh, to investments that these corporations have because their product is is uh, um, hydrocarbons, which are effectively, the product is pollution, right? So there's, there's incredible risk to them in the era of the, cli uh, the Paris Climate Accord, um, where eventually, you know, we hope that governments are actually going to crack down and start um, um, raising regulations and, and talking about potentially leaving some uh, oil and gas assets in the ground and not actually digging them up and burning them. So there are model was to look at the disclosures of corporations. So what are corporations actually saying as far as their evaluation of the emissions embedded in their own reserves? Uh, tied to that, um, their uh, targets for either reducing or increasing their, their emissions or their, their amount of reserves. And then also their material action, uh, what's, what's called material actions related to climate change. So that would be, for example, uh, I mean, Shell's not in our, uh, our sample, but it, it's a good example where Shell actually ties uh, part of the uh, annual bonuses of their CEO and their, their chief financial officer to uh, reducing their, <coughs> excuse me, reducing their uh, emissions uh, intensity of, of their production of oil and gas. So that is a material action Shell is tying uh, a corporate bonus to achieving this, this outcome. Um, so if you look at the big five uh, with these um, three concerns, um, we are able to do this research because there's, uh, there's this movement globally as well as in Canada for corporations to actually disclose this information. This is a fairly new phenomenon in the world. It's only started to happen in the last couple years. But there are a number of uh, non-governmental organizations that have 
um, effectively like uh, internet-based platforms where corporations can go there, they can um, answer a number of questions, it's a standardized sort of uh, form, and a number of oil and gas corporations in fact do this. There's also one tied to the G20 uh, that has a similar sort of motive of getting uh, oil and gas corporations to disclose this information, and then there's another one tied to the UN. So there's all of these initiatives that are putting pressure on corporations that work in oil and gas to disclose certain information. How do you know they're telling the truth? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's tied up into uh, the legalities of their, their investment and they, they need to tell the truth to banks and their investors because the investors ultimately own the company, right? So some of this information um, that, so this is the question of, are they disclosing this information publicly and to their investors or are they doing actual uh, sort of some modeling about um, if the Paris Agreement was in, in fact uh, brought into force, um, how this would affect their company. Most oil and gas corporations are in fact doing this modeling and projecting you know, into the de uh, decades into the future. They may not be necessarily disclosing that information. So that was part of our research questions that we were trying to discover this information. We don't know, so we did research. Um, so. Here's the, the, the sort of answers that, that we found out. Uh, in response to the Paris Agreement, um, the, the big five uh, tar sands producers, uh, some of them are actually uh, modeling various uh, carbon pricing scenarios and how they will affect their business. Uh, unfortunately, these, uh, so they'll say in, in an annual report that yes, we're doing this modeling, but they, they don't actually disclose it publicly. So we can't, as uh, you know, independent researchers or if I was, you know, someone was involved in government interested in this, and certainly the government of Alberta has a, has a huge vested interest in this sort of information, um, it's not actually publicly available. So the corporations are clearly doing this analysis, it's internal, they're not even sharing it with their shareholders at this point. Um, some individual corporations, including some of the largest oil corporations in the world uh, as well, so Exxon would be one of the largest uh, corporate, uh, oil corporations in the, in the world, as well as Suncor, the largest Canadian uh, oil corporation, are actually being forced by shareholder resolutions at their annual general meetings to start publicly disclosing this information. So if we were to update this research uh, a year or two from now, with that modeling will probably be publicly available. So that's important though, they're, they're disclosing certain basic statistical information about their emissions, but they're not actually disclosing their modeling. Um, so first of all, we can't check their work, and secondly, we can't really evaluate how they're thinking about these things, so that's important. Uh, it's, a, it's a transparency measure that is, is very limited at this point. Um, uh, the second point was was around uh, if, if they've created emissions uh, reduction targets. Um, and unfortunately, um, a couple of, of, of the big five uh, tar sands producers have, uh, in fact, uh, produce targets, but they're, um, uh, they're emissions intensity targets. So yeah. they want to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that they're burning to produce their oil. Um, but all five corporations uh, are are projecting that their overall emissions that they're, they're uh, going to uh, produce, uh, as well as the emissions embedded in the oil or gas they're producing, um, their overall emissions are going to grow over time, over the next few decades. Uh, all five of the corporations uh, uh, project this as, as the future they think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's pretty alarming because four of the five corporations acknowledge the Paris Agreement. Uh, the only one that doesn't is, is Imperial. And as Eric mentioned, Imperial is a subsidiary of ExxonMobil. Uh, if, if you follow sort of um, climate news or, or corporate corruption news, you will know that ExxonMobil is one of the largest uh, climate change deniers uh, in the world. They have been over the last few decades. This has been exposed. They're actually being uh, sued right now because of this uh, uh, deception. Um, so the last thing that we looked at was material actions that corporations are taking to uh, reduce their impact on the environment. Um, and as you would imagine, if they have very limited targets for reducing their, their pollution, they probably have very limited uh, uh, material actions that they're undertaking, and that is in fact the case. Um, so there are certain mandatory measures basically in line with regulations that would come down from the federal government or the, the government of Alberta that all corporations have to meet. So obviously this, these corporations have done those uh, mandatory measures. Um, Imperial and Husky, that's basically all they've done. They've done nothing else. They, they haven't thought about um, you know, further reduction of, of their impact on the environment. Um, 
Suncor, Canadian Natural Resources, and Cenevis um, have uh, reduced their emissions uh, in intensity in the last few years, um, largely through uh, having less frac gas input into uh, producing oil through um, uh, in situ technology, uh, which we can get into if you don't know what that is. But um, so here's the thing, though. Obvious, this might be an obvious statement, but it needs to be made because uh, obviously these, these corporations don't quite get it. Um, what the Paris Agreement means for them, the bottom line is business as usual can't continue. Uh, the Paris Agreement, is it, it is acknowledged by Moody's Investor Services as well as uh, our report, a number of other reports, uh, means that business as usual is not going to continue. There needs to be uh, an absolute reduction in greenhouse gases or, uh, uh, emitted into the atmosphere. So we need an overall reduction in, in pollution, so that's, that effectively means we need an overall reduction in the actual production of oil and gas over a, a number of years. Um, and, and right now, unfortunately, I don't know if you were following the news around uh, the, the COP23 meeting that just happened in Bonn, Germany, but you have this push uh, by the Canadian federal government along with the, the British government and a number of other countries to phase out coal, uh, especially for rich countries by 2040 is the objective. And a number of, of rich uh, North American and European countries are going to do that. Uh, but for the Canadian government, I think one of the reasons they're pushing that is um, they get to not mention the other major uh, source of pollution coming out of Canada, which is, which is the oil industry. And so I, I think what's going to happen uh, as far as the Canadian government strategy is they're going to try to cheerlead the phase out of coal, and that's, that's a great thing. Um, uh, it, it was actually started by uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper in 2012, but um, the fact of the matter is the, the largest uh, growing source of carbon pollution in Canada is uh, the Alberta oil industry, right? So if you're just going to do coal and you're not going to do the other one, it's, it's really not good enough. Um, so that was our uh, research, I guess, looking at beyond the sort of economic and financial stuff that Eric talked about, uh, sort of getting into um, the environmental impact of, of these particular five corporations and how we can think about evaluating their impact and, and how they are in fact thinking about that. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Emma now who's uh, going to talk about um, uh, conflicts and, and sort of civil unrest that arises from new um, oil and gas development or pipeline uh, developments. Just say when. All right, I should lower this. Some, can people hear me? Does that? Okay, perfect. Um, so I think that both Eric and Ian have really sort of set up this era that we find ourselves in. Uh, so once again, it's one in which we are confronted with this idea of having um, extractable yet unburnable reserves. And I think that that is important to always kind of hold in the back of your mind. Um, so as we've heard, in this current political moment, you know, business as usual is really being propelled forward uh, by these oil companies and these investors. And contrary to what Jason Kenney and many other people in Alberta would kind of have us believe, this is being actively upheld by both levels of the provincial and the federal government. So literally as we speak, Rachel Notley is on this pro-pipeline tour across the country, uh, going to Toronto, to Calgary, to Vancouver, um, in order to once again reassert the fact that the Alberta government would like these pipelines to be constructed. So I think that in being confronted with this reality uh, that oil companies' business plans, as Ian said, are incompatible uh, with a livable future on this planet, we're really left in this position uh, where it's increasingly up to everyday citizens to take it upon themselves to kind of um, resist in the ways that are required. Um, so for the next 10 minutes or so, what I'm going to be speaking about is sort of uh, future directions of research for the corporate mapping project. Um, these are not yet things that uh, we're like actively writing, but they're proposals that we're thinking about um, that revolve much more around uh, these forms of resistance that we need. And again, how it is that we can begin to lay this solid foundation to a just transition. And what does that require? Um, so specifically, I thought that it would be useful to uh, narrow in on pipelines and explore why it is that they're not only a necessary intervention, but also a strategic one. Um, 
So to begin, I think that there are some very basic misunderstandings uh, that I'm sure all of us in the room uh, know, but I think that they are important to address. Uh, so firstly, you know, both Justin Trudeau and Rachel Notley would have us believe that A, uh, new pipelines are needed to transport bitumen to be upgraded and shipped, and B, that Canada can actually meet its climate commitments while expanding oil and gas production and while continuing to build these pipelines. Uh, so David Hughes has recently debunked both of these myths um, in a report that was released by the Corporate Mapping Project in June of 2016. Uh, and it's quite aptly called, Can Canada Expand Oil and Gas Production, Build Pipelines, and Keep Its Climate Change Commitments? <laughs> uh, so in sum, he found that under Alberta's current oil sands emissions cap, uh, new pipelines aren't actually needed to transport bitumen. So considering that the cap actually lowers, well, it doesn't lower, it allows for a 45% increase uh, in growth in the oil sands above 2014 levels. But even with that increase, all of our existing pipeline and rail capacity can uh, carry all of this to market. So we don't need any more pipelines, even with that uh, huge expansion that at a planetary level we can't afford. Um, so actually, yeah, yeah perfect. perfect, okay. You can't see it, give them license, please. Uh, I think there's a question. Oh, wait, yeah, the other way around. Thank you. Yeah, there. No, no, that's okay. You can do it more. This moves a lot. <laughs> That's fine. I, can, I have good eyes. <laughs> Should we take a vote? <laughs> Sorry, there's, there's two options. Sorry about that. Oh. We can. Oh, that's. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Oh, we can't stop it. Yeah, okay. Why don't we, I'll explain the graph a little bit and then we can turn the lights back on because there aren't a lot of other graphics. Um, so as I said, this graphic really does show us that our existing pipeline and rail capacity is sufficient um, to bring all of this to market. And as we can see from this, it actually includes having a 15% surplus that allows for uh, maintenance, for outages, and so on. So even considering that, it's not that these would be completely full. We still do have some uh, capacity to work with. Uh, so fortunately, and I'll get to this later, uh, but we can eliminate energy east out of this. So there we go. A little less bleak, but uh, yeah, that's good. Still it's far above. Um, so furthermore, if the pipelines uh, that have been approved to date are built, it actually means that the remainder of the Canadian economy will have to drastically reduce its emissions if we have any chance of meeting the Paris uh, climate commitments. So what this does, um, yeah, so basically all other sectors of the economy are going to have to drastically cut their emissions while we allow the oil and gas industry to sort of take up uh, this, you know, big piece of our carbon budget. So I think it's critical to understand, um, as a side note, I once had to explain this to Dominic LeBlanc, who is, you know, a prominent figure obviously right now in the government. Uh, it's critical to understand that as multi-billion dollar investments, pipelines lock us into further development. And people don't think it you know, very often in those terms, um, and we need to continue to say that. Um, so with that being said, we can understand, I think, that pipelines are necessary points of intervention if we're to kind of meet these targets. So they're projects that dramatically increase carbon emissions um, in return for very, uh, you know, massive gains in corporate profit, uh, as Eric kind of pointed out, and they create an environment where all other sectors of the economy are really uh, forced to make these deep emissions cuts that are beyond their fair share and that are very unrealistic in a lot of ways. 
So not only are they necessary points of intervention, but I also think that they are strategic. If we're to think of um, you know, mass movements and social movements and what we can do to kind of propel this change that we need. So there are a number of reasons why I think we should look at them as strategic targets. Um, the first is that we know that bottlenecks can slow oil sands overall rate of expansion. Uh, so companies have to be able to get their product to market. They still can. But if we are to increase, again, this, rail, this pipeline capacity, it allows for further growth in the oil sands. Um, and campaigns around pipelines also lead to wariness around investors, hmm. for the most part. As long as we don't have Steve Williams blabbing his <laughs> mouth more to all of these investors, then we can at least you know, take some assurance with that. Doesn't care. Uh, so banks and other major financers are you know, less likely to invest in fossil fuel infrastructure projects if they predict that they'll be delayed by lengthy court battles um, or challenged by major acts of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. The second reason that pipelines are strategic points for resistance, and I think that this is the most important one, is because they really galvanize very strong opposition movements. And there's a number of reasons for this. So first, uh, in crossing you know, huge swaths of both treaty and unceded and unsurrendered territories, pipelines have elicited very strong opposition from First Nations from the very beginning. Um, and as I'll come back to, because of this and for you know, many other reasons, it really is indigenous communities that must be, well, that are already you know, best positioned to determining what the strategies are behind these campaigns and directing the course of action um, in these kind of anti-pipeline movements. But the other point that's important is that pipelines' risk of spills and the threats they pose to drinking water in particular um, galvanize support from very unlikely allies. So we saw this, for instance, Keystone XL is a prime example of the way that ranchers and farmers um, and people who you know, would not conventionally be so anti-oil really kind of came together um, through these threats, basically, that were posed to water. Um, this happened quite a bit, too, with Energy East, um, and it's a main kind of galvanizing tool uh, in Quebec. So again, they sort of exist as these strategic points for resistance, first for their ability to slow industry's rates of expansion, but also uh, to really create broad-based opposition movements. So I think that opposition movements uh, and I'm going over this because I think that sometimes, you know, we don't necessarily take a step back and talk about this enough. Um, but they really have looked at a multitude of targets in kind of uh, propelling these campaigns forward. So first, I think that campaigns have really historically directed much of their attention to what we would call primary targets. So the oil companies themselves um, have really been, you know, the people that we're putting front and center. But I think what we're increasingly seeing is that um, there's now these secondary targets. So the banks, the investors, um, and, and these targets tend to kind of be considered softer targets, quote unquote. Uh, and they're seen to be, you know, perhaps more likely to be persuaded based on the fact that they care more about branding and optics. Uh, a great example of that, for instance, is TD Canada. TD Canada is, you know, they like to kind of project this image of being a green bank. Uh, they have a Friends of the Environment program and so on, and they're one of the biggest funders um, of a lot of the major uh, fossil fuel infrastructure projects that are currently on the table. Um, and as I said, I think that anti-pipeline opposition movements, uh, you know, have really adopted this kind of diversity of targets or diversity of tactics. So they've taken, you know, direct legal challenges, civil disobedience and direct action, as well as these other campaigns that are targeting those secondary um, targets. So what I want to do now is just kind of turn to this case of Energy East, because I think it's important for us to kind of dig into you know, what are the lessons that we can learn um, from pipelines that have been canceled and from the ones that uh, are no longer on the table. So while it is true that the recent cancellation of Energy East, you know, really was a matter of, biz uh, was a business decision uh, and it was based on, you know, market conditions, I think it's critically important to understand the role that social movements still played in ultimately leading to that cancellation. Um, so first, I think the, the case of Energy East really shows us that timing is everything. So 
The project was first proposed in 2012. Uh, and it was actually initially projected to be approved in 2014 um, with construction being completed by 2018. Um, so it was largely the actions of indigenous communities, grassroots activists, labor unions, and NGOs that delayed the project uh, into a period where it became both politically and economically unfeasible. So these delays from social movements were critical to pushing the pipeline, you know, uh, hearings and so on into this period where it was no longer a feasible project. So perhaps, yeah, so one of the, one of the most important uh, aspects of that as well was that, you know, over 100,000 messages were actually sent to the National Energy Board uh, demanding that it consider both upstream and downstream emissions uh, of the project. And two years later, the NEB said that they were going to put Energy East to a climate test, and that would be the first pipeline that would have to go through um, this, this sort of review. And so as we've seen time and time again, it was indigenous communities who really led the way um, with this opposition. So the Assembly of First Nations of Quebec and Labrador, the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, the Iroquois Caucus, the Gunnestake Mohawks opposed the project, yeah. all using this, um, you know, all of these tactics that were at their disposal. So there were legal challenges, there were acts of civil disobedience, uh, so on and so forth. So the project's first major delay um, was really this grassroots legal challenge around the Kakuna Marine Terminal um, that would put at risk the, the breeding grounds of beluga whales in the St. Lawrence uh, River. And so the challenge specifically delayed the project for about two years. So that was a critical period of time. And TransCanada just sort of scrambled and failed and scrambled and failed to find a new place to kind of situate this terminal. And so, and then, sorry, the second major delay was, of course, the Shrey Affair, uh, where a conflict of interest really called into question the actual legality of this project. Um, and it ultimately halted the NEB's hearings. The NEB sort of collapsed. Everyone, you know, dropped out. And then they had to kind of reassemble an entire new board to actually hear this uh, pipeline review. So finally, I think uh, there are you know, these very important lessons that we can look to with that movement. So the first um, is that delays not only cost oil companies millions of dollars, but they actually create this climate of uncertainty. And the more that we can create that climate of uncertainty, the more that investors and banks are going to tell themselves, maybe we should be looking in new directions um, for, for more reliable, you know, projects and so on. Uh, and they actually give opponents the time that they need to coordinate direct actions, but also to drive these policy-oriented changes that are happening behind the scenes. So that whole push, for instance, uh, to have the climate test be incorporated, those delays were critical to making sure that people had the time they needed to submit all of these, um, you know, proposals to the, to the hearings and, and so on. Uh, secondly, I think that we can see that broad-based movements that not only follow the lead of Indigenous communities, but that actually actively fund their legal challenges and their forms of resistance are what pose the most serious threat uh, to industry. And finally, I think in the same way that industry is kind of upheld by this corporate nexus that includes governments, banks, and other capitalist institutions, what we find is that resistance movements that similarly coordinate across, um, you know, including all, all kinds of various actors, are the ones who are most successful. So what now? <laughs> Uh, well, now that Energy East has been scrapped, the anti-pipeline movement here in Canada and also across Turtle Island has really turned its attention to the re remaining three pipelines that are on the table. Um, so this includes, of course, the more high-profile Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain expansion, uh, and Bridges Line 3, and Trans Canada's Keystone XL. Uh, the resistance movements to all three of these pipelines are adopting a lot of the tactics I think that we commonly see, so encampments, flotillas, uh, legal challenges, but I think what's perhaps somewhat new is the degree of unity that we're seeing in these opposition movements. Um, I saw this man at the front is actually wearing a t-shirt from the Pull Together campaign, um, which is a legal challenge that was, you know, a united front of First Nations that were coming together and saying, uh, we're going we're gonna to bring this pipeline to court. We raise money for them if anyone wants to make a donation. Great. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So this alliance, you know, and, and then another another example of that is this treaty alliance uh, against tar sands expansion. And they were at the forefront, for instance, of this campaign uh, called Mazaska Talks, which is a global effort to have, you know, the major investors in pipelines pull their money out of these infrastructure projects. So finally, I think that First Nations here in Canada are asserting their rights over their unceded and unsurrendered territory, as they have been since time immemorial. But these are sort of the resistance movements that hold the most hope for stopping these pipelines. Those, so yeah, the Sequemek Nation, for instance, is a really um, great example of this. So. They are building 10 tiny homes directly in the path of the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain expansion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they call themselves the Tiny House Warriors, and they have actually <laughs> begun the process of solarizing these homes with the help of the Lubicon Cree First Nation, uh, which you know is directly impacted by the by the oil sands. Um, it's their traditional territory that has been desecrated. Um, and so I think what we're starting to see is that this future that we need is actually being built in the paths of these pipelines. And so if we're willing to look at the resistance movements closely, what they show us is actually the way forward. So if we're able to put a stop to these pipelines, then the next thing is that we're given uh, those you know, coalitions and strong movements that can help to propel us into this just transition. Yeah. We <laughs> used up all our time. Wow. So um, we've had a, a really uh, important look at extreme oil as a, a commodity uh, in terms of its materiality. We've looked at the, the corporations that, that uh, profit from its extraction and its transportation and the interests involved that extend um, into, into financial in institutions as well as into government itself. Um, we've thought of this not as a context uh, as well in, in terms of an, a particular era that we live in. Um, and we've also looked at some, some important points of resistance. So that's, that's been an incredible amount to cover. Um, in the last hour. We have um, 15 minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to, um, I have my, my mic runners right here. Uh, great. Um, and so um, just keeping uh, to time, I just want to remind you to keep your questions short so that everybody can have an, an opportunity to ask questions. We'll start right here at, uh, in the blue hat um, if you want to pose your question to the panel and I will be, uh, um, and then we'll go next to, if actually maybe we'll pose a couple questions at once if you don't mind. So we'll have um, you two just right there to pose a question and then we'll, and then we'll come to the others. I'm, I'm keeping note of our, our lines as well. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm a big supporter of uh, diversity of tactics, and I, I believe that the uh, civil disobedience, disobedience is really great. But um, with that being said, I was wondering if maybe we, in our attempt to transition, could kind of rather than be on the defensive with, you know, extreme oil creating our own branding, kind of steal their brand of, they say, unconventional oil. Well, let's let's steal that and go on the offensive and say, listen, oil from algae is unconventional oil, and we don't have to pipe it. We don't have to put it through uh, to a train. We can put it in every local community here in Alberta. So why don't we also have, as part of that diversity of tactics, creating worker-owned cooperatives that are creating oil from algae. Thank you. Uh, I read some time back that uh, the oil from Alberta, which I think uh, the, United supplies, uh, the United States is supplied by uh, Canadian oil by about 22%, uh, roughly, and uh, that... Um, uh, at some point in time, uh, because of the shale oil that uh, the United States is getting from their own shale, that uh, uh, our the Canadian oil would be refined and, and, and sold offshore at world price. In other words, d taking away the high uh, wages that would be uh, received here in Canada if we were to uh, have refineries here in, in Canada to d develop it. Good. I'll let the panel take those questions. As, um, we'll just start with two, and then we'll go to some other questions. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'll say about 
um, other sources of energy is uh, one of the other projects I'm looking into is the, the phase out of coal in Alberta. And uh, so I started looking at our, our power companies here, including um, specifically uh, the other day I was looking at NMAX, uh, the power company that supplies power to Calgary. And uh, the interesting thing is um, those power generating companies, uh, or in the, specifically NMAX, has actually been phasing out coal for 20 years and moving towards a mixture of uh, frac gas, uh, so gas-fired uh, power plants, as well as uh, wind uh, in the early 2000s, and more recently solar. So I, I think you have uh, power companies as well as sort of more primary producers of, of energy uh, that are have been for a number of years investing in uh, wind and solar and so I, I don't know if it makes sense to add algae oil whatever that is to that I don't really know anything about that particular um, commodity um, the other question, oh, about the uh, the pipeline to Tidewater sort of argument and how we're going to get a higher price. Yeah, that's that's not true, actually. Uh, that is something that our government uh, likes to use as a marketing line for why we need a pipe, uh, a, an expanded pipeline to Vancouver. But in fact, uh, through the corporate mapping project, Emma mentioned David Hughes. Uh, he's written a couple papers for us. He is uh, one of the most preeminent um, uh, geoscientists in North America. And it, it just doesn't add up as far as uh, getting a higher price. And there's a number of reasons for that. One of which is uh, oil sands is, is considered junk oil. It's, it's not a high quality fuel. Um, so it's, you're not going to get the world price because the world price is for a, a better commodity than what we actually produce. Uh, secondly, you have to ship the oil. And in this case, we're talking about shipping it to certain Asian markets. Uh, and in the case of China, their, their upgraders uh, can't even process uh, oil sands at this point. They actually have to add technologies to their current refineries to do that. So that's an additional cost beyond which you're shipping across the Pacific Ocean, which again costs money. So this idea that you're going to get this higher price is um, just factually inaccurate and unfortunately the government of Alberta continues to um, to say that um, that untrue statement so yeah do you have any other comments so when here and is in the back which one we have the in the purple yeah yeah, we've got a, a speaker okay. order, so I'll get to you. Okay, I, I just have um, some answers to some questions. So, um, whenever I d talk about the uh, trans the Energy East, uh, people say to me, well, uh, the Maritimes are importing oil from Saudi Arabia. Now, isn't that more dangerous going, being having to be shipped into there? And then um, the other thing is um, that I witnessed the, the rail spill at Lake Wabanum, and, I, and then I began to wonder, well, I, you know, wouldn't pipelines be safer to transfer that oil across Lake Wabnum? Well, Lake Wabnum was um, out of commission for quite a few years after that disastrous oil spill ra via rail. Okay, and um, there was one in the back, I believe, before. We can have our, our mic yeah, run back there. Okay, there was one in the back, and then we'll go with this one here. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to switch the focus to, to sort of more broad abstract to see if in your experience you can, your information has any sort of bearing on these sort of questions. One is, um, it, I'm not aware of any way to run the US military off of anything other than oil. I'm wondering how much of that is, is focusing this. I'm wondering how much in your economics is concerned to protect the US as a world reserve currency playing in this. And thirdly, I'm wondering how easily could this pipeline system be used to transport a glacier water melting to the United States or across Canada once severe climate change hits? Great, thank you. And I just want to get a couple more questions so we have them in play. Um, we have um, in gray here, and also, and, and, and we had a, a question over here, and we'll then pass it back to the panel. You have to write some notes. Yeah. When Eric talked about the philosophy of the oil companies being sending their investment money back to the shareholders and and uh, dividends, uh, price of shares, buying back shares and dividends, why does any government ever subsidize oil companies? Because they're not putting it into jobs, they're not putting it into looking after the environment, and if 
the government stops subsidizing oil companies, uh, what would that do to keep it in the earth? How would it decrease the development? Okay. And can we just grab one more, just this gentleman right here? Hi. Uh, one of the appeals for oil sands construction or pipeline construction is there's this, uh, in the past it's created a lot of uh, good paying union jobs. Uh, from what I've seen recently, more and more of these jobs are going to the Christian Labor Association or non-union. And uh, you know, you mentioned Imperial Oil a couple of times. Uh, their last shutdown that they did was completely fly in and fly out. So I'm wondering, what is the real economic benefit to this province with all the fly in, fly out, and all the clack, and all the temporary foreign workers? What is the benefit to this province? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer a few, and then maybe my colleagues will take up. But I, I think the two last questions were, were, were more comments that are really true. Um, I think when a company focuses on, on, on consolidating and cutting costs and squeezing costs, well, we know where, we know where those, those costs will be, labor costs. So I think that that is really, and, and unfortunately, it's not a short-term adjustment. It is a consolidating um, practice inside a more medium-term um, um, situation because of the way the oil market has changed in North America, because um, the shale oil boom has transformed the status. See, before the shale oil boom, the oil sands were the de facto alternative oil to the oil that you pump. When the shale oil took off, then that's what became the de facto lower cost. And that totally changed the oil market. So I think this is going to be a more long-term problem. Um, and we'll have to maybe have some, some difficult conversations and, uh, around, you know, tied to the carbon cost, tied to the fact that it's not generating jobs, good jobs, but creating bad jobs, tied to the fact that it's probably exporting a lot of money out of uh, Alberta. And, and impoverishing the province, maybe you know, some conversation about socializing these assets or nationalizing these assets will have to get on the table at one point. That's a but I don't know. You know I'm, not, I'm not an Albertan. I'm, I'm from elsewhere, and I, I'll leave it to you guys. <laughs> so rapidly, and then I want the others to be able to talk. Um, rapidly, Energy East uh, uh, and versus uh, Saudi Arabian oil. Okay. Um, no. Um, most of the oil used in the East comes from the U.S., um, Norway, and some of it does come from um, a problematic country, which is, which is um, Algeria, and some of it also comes from, tu uh, not Tunisia, but sorry, Algeria and um, Qaddafi's. No, uh, no. Uh, no, God, we're, Gaddafi was before. Um, yeah. Libya, Libyan oil. So I have Libyan oil, which is American oil, right? Because the oil assets in Libya belong to US. I mean, the, the, they've got mercenaries guarding it. Um, so it's Libya, but most of it is actually from the US. We're using shale oil. In, in, and we're using a lot of oil from Norway, from the North Sea. So, so Saudi Arabia is part of the mix, but it's not that much part of the mix. Um, and anyway, the oil from Energy East, we weren't, our, our refineries weren't able to really transform it. And it's bunker fuel. I mean, let's, you know, let's get to the real, I mean, if we want to discuss this. Basically, oil sands or tar sands oil is the primary market is bunker fuel for the world shipping industry. And, and I, I'm going to just step away from the mic in a minute and just, you know, here, okay? They, they can refine the heavy oil. They've got the equipment to refine the heavy oil. While why? Because they're getting the oil from Mexico and from Venezuela. And in their, in their refining mix, they need some heavy oil. Now, they know they're going to run out of oil from Venezuela and from Mexico very fast. That's why they want Keystone XL to have in their mix a source of heavy oil. That's it. It's not for Canadians. It never was. Never, never was. Okay, rail versus pipes. Two things on that. Um, first, there was a spill last week in a in a in a uh, one of the in Keystone. Um, um, so so pipelines, and this is a new this is the new generation pipeline, right? This is the pipeline that never leaks, that never has accidents, right? This is Keystone. So second thing, pipelines and rail go together. The more you build pipelines, the more you have uh, productive capacity, and. The rail, um, Suncor doesn't want new pipelines because it wants rail. Why does it want rail? Because rail is point-to-point -point delivery. You want to deliver so much at this area. See, the thing is, a pipeline is a highway, 
right? A rail system is your secondary road system. It's more flexible, smaller quantities, you can control, you can decide, and you can store. You can't store oil the same way in a pipeline as you can store through, through the shipping system on, on rail. Um, yes, the US currency is tied to oil, and yes, the US military gobbles up huge amount of oil, and yes, I've heard of this idea of using the pipelines to ship water, but um, I'll stop there, and I'd like to, maybe others wanna. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right, okay, we're going to wrap up with this. Uh, the comment on, on subsidies. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, globally as well as in Canada, uh, the uh, hydrocarbon industry, sp specifically oil, is, is subsidized to the tune of you know, tens of billions of dollars a year. In Canada, that subsidization is through uh, low corporate taxes, uh, extremely low royalties. Uh, we have almost the, the lowest royalties in the world for oil. And, and uh, different categories of hydrocarbons that we get royalties for. Um, and, and, but we also need to talk about subsidies uh, in the context of, of the history of the development of, of the oil industry in Alberta. So when, when that developed, if you read uh, Jillian Stewart's report that we published, uh, I think at the beginning of the summer, uh, one of the things Jillian was looking at is going back into the 70s and 80s, in order to actually develop the ability to extract bitumen, uh, we needed to develop t technology. That technology was developed at this university uh, with, with government money, uh, mostly uh, uh, the government in Alberta's money, they they uh, developed this uh, our uh, research and, and development project that uh, is one of the largest research and development projects in the history of Canada, hmm. and that was funded by our tax dollars as Albertans. Uh, so there's that we we developed the technology uh, to get the oil out of the ground. We developed the technology of the in situ technology where you're you're pumping steam into the ground now to extract oil in a different way. Uh, that that was um, technology that was developed uh, through public universities and then. And commercialized and and of course the profits go to uh, private interests as opposed to back into the public because that's the way these things work uh, as well as uh, you know you had to develop Fort McMurray as an entire community highways schools public sector workers like nurses and social workers all those things uh, that we paid for as well as we even built a freaking pipeline from Fort McMurray to Edmonton in the 80s which cost in, in 1980s dollars I, I think it was a uh, hundred million dollars that was again taxpayer dollars, right? And then uh, you know you get into further into the history of, of Alberta. It seemed pretty good at, at a certain point, and so the PCs were so bad at managing our money that they didn't know what to do once they had, they'd funded all these things in order to extract all the oil, and then there was the oil boom, the, the price went up, so they just started giving money away to people to sort of buy consent uh, effectively, um, and then unfortunately they didn't save the money, and here we are now, we have not even $20 billion in our heritage fund, uh, and you know we've got an oil industry that's continuing on, and as Eric said, is suppressing labor costs, is actually restructuring to the point where uh, they got rid of 50,000 jobs. They might be bringing 17 of those 17,000 jobs back. That means permanently, we in the last th three years have lost 30,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. Good, uh, high-paying jobs that simply do not exist anymore. And and we are the province, and through our tax dollars, made this industry possible. And now you have a, a select handful of corporations that are literally uh, every quarter making uh, at least a billion dollars, if not over the course of the year. The, the big five corporations I was talking about, their profits are in the multi-billion dollars. Mm. And that's as Eric as yeah. Anyway, I'm going to finish my sentence. As Eric said, that money is flowing out of Alberta because largely the shareholders of these corporations are not Albertans, yeah. right? They're either global or they're banks or, or whatever, but that money is leaving when in fact the wealth was produced based on our public investment, largely. Yeah.